final session uh, of the Japan update uh, in which uh, we'll have a conversation about repositioning the Australia-Japan relationship. Uh, I think, uh, as uh, Brett Mason said this morning, uh, perhaps uh, at no time has the Australia-Japan relationship been closer than it is today. Uh, the relationship uh, suggests that I should retire from my job. <laughs> it's in great shape. Uh, this year has seen the two countries sign the Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, uh, a free trade arrangement uh, that sees uh, a deeper trade and investment liberalisation regime between them bilaterally than they've ever had before, built of course, uh, upon the 57 years of close engagement after the signature of the Australia-Japan Agreement on Commerce in 1957. And the less noticed, but actually fundamentally important, Agreement on Friendship and Cooperation in 1976, uh, signed between the Fraser government and the Miki government, it then was. Uh, so the economic relationship has been put within a new institutional framework. Uh, alongside that, there's a new security declaration in uh, Japan at the time of the Abe visit to Tokyo uh, between the two governments, the second such declaration. We'll come back to that in our discussion. Uh, and uh, as Brett said this morning, the rapport uh, between the two Prime Ministers, Abe and Abbott, uh, symbolises the intimacy there is in the relationship between the two countries. It's really uh, quite a remarkable uh, thing to see. Uh, uh, and uh, that augurs well for the future. So in this sense... Uh, I guess the relationship's already been repositioned because if you look at the relationship over the last 20 years or so, there's been a lot of activity there uh, founded on a very solid base, but it was in a kind of a drift. You know, we had an active period when we had annual ministerial meetings, lots of visits both ways round by high-level political leaders, uh, but... Uh, that drifted away and the last year or two has seen really a dramatic revivi re revivification of the uh, relationship at all levels. Uh, and uh, the promise uh, that uh, the arrangements that have been put in place will develop further more substantially down the track. So uh, I think uh, we can talk about where we've got to and how we've got there, but we also want to talk in this session about uh, where we might go, what the potential of the relationship is going forward, and in that sense, the repositioning of the relationship as well. Uh, so welcome to the panel. We've got a panel that covers the whole spectrum of the relationship, uh, a very impressive panel. Uh, Dr. Amy King from the Centre for Strategic and Defence Studies here at the ANU is a lecturer uh, in the centre uh, uh, who uh, specialised on Japan but also on the Japan-China relationship, especially going back to the normalisation of relations between uh, Japan and China in the 1970s. Professor uh, Yoshihide uh, Soeya, who's a professor of international relations, as you know, and political science in the Faculty of Law at Keio University and uh, is well known to us here in Australia as a leading thinker uh, about developments in Japan's international relations and international politics uh, and developments in Japan's position in the region and in global affairs. Uh, and uh, Shiro Armstrong, uh, who's co-director of the Australia-Japan Research Centre here uh, in the Crawford School at the ANU. So welcome to the panel. I thought what I might, might do to start the conversation 
uh, going is to ask you each actually to reflect upon uh, the relationship today uh, in particular. Is the descriptor of it by, if you like, those who have a vested interest in it, like myself or the Parliamentary Foreign Secretary or uh, those of us who are at this meeting today, do you think that's uh, a good descriptor of the relationship, uh, the, the most intimate and the deepest relationship we've had between the two countries uh, ever? And uh, is it on a base that justifies that descriptor? Maybe we turn to the Japanese first, uh, Yoshi. Oh. Uh, how do you see the relationship from not only a specialist perspective in Japan, but, but how the relationship is viewed more generally in the relevant policy influential community in Japan? Well, uh, I, well, but before that, I would like to thank organizers <laughs> for <laughs> inviting me to this uh, very prestigious uh, second time, second year, uh, Japan update. And Australia is all, all the time my favorite destination. So, and I come back here from time to time. Uh, I wish I had more invitations. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, have, having thanked uh, the organizers, uh, well, uh, in, I think my frank immediate response to your question directly is uh, there is not much discussion. Uh, I mean, uh, spontaneous uh, you know, uh, discussions about uh, recent developments between Japan and Australia. And I think uh, that, that is not necessarily a bad sign, perhaps, because the relationship is so natural and uh, there is no major problem except a big creature swimming in the ocean. <laughs> and uh, the and, uh, uh, image of Australia is very positive, and I, I would assume the same is true, uh, more or less, here in Australia, vis-a-vis -vis Japan. And so, so I think uh, the, the, maybe it's fair to say that the relationship is in a way taken for granted and uh, it's not a big surprise to see kind of cordial relations between the two leaders uh, evolving. Uh, but, uh, but having said that, I think uh, the negative side of that, you know, some, some are taking for granted uh, reality in Japan is there should be more appreciation of the importance of the relationship. Uh, just taking it as a natural partnership because, uh, as you said, uh, there was second security declaration signed by the two leaders. But the first declaration was in 2007, year 2007. At that time, our Prime Minister was also the same person, uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe. And uh, Japan and Australia signed AXA uh, on the basis of that security declaration. Uh, acquisition and cross-servicing agreement uh, bet between the two militaries. And of course, the kind of uh, joint activities which uh, J Japanese and Australian militaries can engage in are kind of typical non-traditional security domains. There is no element of traditional security cooperation. And, and so I think these, these things uh, should be given uh, more emphasis, explicit emphasis as an important development, particularly for, for the Japanese side, because this, you know, AXA is uh, the second AXA which Japan signed with uh, foreign countries uh, after the United States. And uh, the fact that we could do that with Australia, no other countries, I think it should be very significant in talking about how Japanese, you know, regional security engagement, uh, you know, has evolved uh, in, in recent years. And I take it very seriously. This is a very important development, not only between, in the relationship between us, but for Japanese you know, regional security engagement. Well, I want to come back to that later on. Uh, yes. Just yeah. uh, so that's my look kind on of the general, general impression. Yeah, first. impression. Uh, w one thing that interested me, though, was uh, how you observed that the relationship was little noticed in Japan. I mean, the Abe visit here had a big impact uh, in terms of public reaction, in terms of press. Mm -hmm. uh, did it get that kind of impact in Japan or not? It was reported, I think, mm. you know, uh, reasonably well. Mm. But, but uh, in terms of the impact, I'm not quite sure. Mm. Uh, at, at least, uh, to be frank again, uh, I, I myself had not had such discussions with 
<laughs> any of my colleagues. <laughs> no, yeah. Amy, uh, would, you, would you accept uh, our general description of the relationship as it is now? Yeah, I, th I think I would, absolutely. Um, and I think as Professor Sawyer has pointed out, you know, there is a, an earlier history to this closening, particularly under the Abe administration the first time around. But I think what really marks this period as a characteristically different one is that <laughs> the economics and the security have both ratcheted up, if you like. Um, I think, you know, looking right back to the 50s, obviously, uh, the economic community in Australia was much more enthusiastic about uh, the relationship with Japan. And I think the sec security community, it's fair to say, was deeply ambivalent, probably until the late 80s. Um, and then, really, under the Hawke-Keating government, we started to see the opening up of a security relationship with Japan. Um, that was um, accelerated under Howard with the, with the signing of... Um, uh, this, the security partnership agreement, elevating the relationship to that level. Uh, but I think what the difference between now and, sort of, uh, I guess, the last period of coalition government in Australia and the last period of, um, of the Koizumi and the Abe, Abe period in Japan is that the Japanese side is now a lot more receptive to moving further on security uh, than they were the previous time around. And so I think last time around, under Howard, Australia wanted to take the relationship in security terms a lot further than Japan was prepared to go. Uh, and I think now we're seeing some greater appetite in Japan to, uh, to go further with that. And should are your general observations of the relationship? Yeah, look, I, I agree with both Amy and Soya-san, um, and especially the fact that it has been taken for granted and, and underappreciated. Um, it's such a, a deep and broad and stable relationship economically um, and politically that uh, it doesn't get much press day to day. Um, and I think the... Uh, the visit by Prime Minister Abe helped highlight um, to us here in Australia anyway, um, it gave us an opportunity to talk a bit about that, how important Japan was and highlighted by um, the EPA that was signed. Um, so to talk about it being the closest it's ever been, I, I'm not sure. I, I haven't lived through the ups and downs as others in this room and yourself would have. But um, in, in more recent times, I think, because it has been taken for granted, um, I think this is a, a useful year to reflect on the relationship. Well, let's turn to the economic relationship, which is the base, as Amy said, of building up a broader relationship, including touching on the security areas. Uh, and we've got this new economic yeah. partnership agreement with, <coughs> with Japan. How does that change fundamentally the economic relationship if it changes the economic relationship fundamentally? Um, well, I don't think it's a game changer for the economic relationship. Um, as I mentioned already, we have a, a strong economic relationship. Um, it's worth taking a step back and, and recalling Japan's our second largest, second most important economic partner, um, $80 billion in trade and investment annually. Uh, and that's without the, the EPA, that's before the economic partnership agreement. It was very good to get it signed. It was seven years in the making. Um, it was a niggling part of the bilateral relationship, but now we can get that out of the way and get on with, with business. Um, um, it, it benefits some sectors, um, in Australian farmers and some service providers, but given how large the economic relationship is, um, it's not a game changer. In one sense, the strictly bilateral relationship between uh, Japan and Australia uh, on the trade side has shrunk, not absolutely, of course, but relatively. So it's a much smaller proportion, uh, the trade relationship with Japan, than it used to be of Australia's overall uh, trade relationships. Uh, so how does the economic partnership relationship play into that? Is it likely to boost the share of direct trade between Australia and Japan, or uh, doesn't it have much significance in that particular respect? Well, uh, the evidence on these agreements, these bilateral um, preferential agreements, free trade agreements, if you will, that, that are trading concessions between countries, uh, there's not much evidence of them having significant, you know, positive economic effects on, on economic relations. And I don't think this one will have a measurable effect on the relationship. Um, you look at the literature, there's very little evidence that these agreements matter all that much. I think the Productivity Commission did a review into this in 2010. Um, they can make a difference, um, but I think they're sold more to the public as an economic agreement, whereas they should be recognised as, as more of a political agreement too. So 
J Japan's trade share in Australia might be falling relatively, but it's still a very, very big, it's still our second largest export destination, second largest economic partner. It's, it's um, very significant. Uh, it's just, it's not going to have the same effect that the 57 and 76 agreements um, had that you mentioned. Um, those agreements were multilateral in character. The 57 agreement um, recognized Japan as an equal trading partner for Australia. We treated Japan equally as we treat all other trading partners. Um, and the 76 agreement did that for investment and more, opened up um, a little bit more tourism and, and um, people movement. So those were agreements that had significant measurable impacts on the economic relationship um, because they weren't sort of preferential. They were multilateral, recognizing Japan, giving it most favored nation status, that's, that's treating it as an equal to all other countries. Can, um, I, can I add? Yes, please. Uh, I'm not an economist. I cannot talk about it from an economic do. point of view, <laughs> <laughs> from political point of view. Uh, as uh, already I said in the previous session, I mean, agriculture is the biggest issue uh, as far as Japan's you know, uh, conduct of this practice goes. But previously, starting with Singapore, I mean, yes, I think we started with countries with which we have less of an issue about you know, agricultural products. But Australian case, I mean, there was agricultural products. And so despite that, uh, you know, the agreement was reached. I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. And so that should be more highlighted. Mm -hmm. and, and in the discussion of agricultural thing in Japan, I think there are two major concerns. Uh, one is, of course, stability of supply. You know, the conservative politicians make an argument if, if you rely too much you know, upon foreign countries. Uh, when uh, food crisis happened, in the, you know, and, and so forth. I mean, there, there, there aren't much, you know, huge possibility for that to happen, but that kind of argument is politically very strong. And uh, the other issue is food security, right? Safety, you know, food safety. And I think with respect to those two, Australia has basically no problem. I don't think Australia w would use, you know, this as a political tool, <laughs> you know, that in its game, diplomatic game with Japan. Uh, to be frank, we have a concern about China, for instance. If we become too much interdependent, I mean, China could use economic means for political purposes. Uh, but but uh, there is no worry, of, you know, of that sort, Australia. And uh, with food safety, too, perhaps, you know, the, the, there should be no, no, no basic concern. So uh, agricultural thing with Australia, I think, is, is an example with which to, we can discuss domestically you know, about those basic concerns. And uh, so, so these, these, I think, political uh, aspects of uh, free trade agreement with Australia, I think, in my view, should, should be, should be emphasised uh, more. Well, I think you make a really very important point that this agreement distinguishes itself by Japan's willingness to negotiate freer access to its agricultural markets. And that's symbolic in a number of ways, partly because it signals uh, a new commitment to liberalisation uh, in uh, Japanese agriculture consistent with Abe's third arrow, for example. Uh, and it also potentially plays into broader liberalisation beyond uh, Australian access to the Japanese market, uh, access to others. Our American partners, of course, aren't too happy about the extent that, to which we secured liberalisation of access to the American markets. But, Sho, uh, how important do you think the Australia-Japan agreement will be uh, in the positioning in TPP on liberalisation of access to, Amer to uh, uh, the Japanese market for the American supplies? Right. Well, as you say, it's the first agreement Japan signed that had any serious agricultural liberalisation. Um, the rest are with a lot of Southeast Asian or developing economies, except for Switzerland, that, as Aurelia said earlier, protected agriculture at home while tried to expand uh, trade and investment abroad. So in that sense, it's significant. Um, um, it did include um, some cuts into some significant liberalisation into Japanese agriculture. Um, but the biggest beneficiaries being Australian beef producers still weren't happy with the access that we got. It wasn't as much as we wanted. And I think that can tell you, uh, give you a sign of, of how much further we could have gone and, and um, how much further really Japan has to go. So um, I think the United States wasn't so happy about um, the EPA that we 
reach the, um, the, the cuts in agriculture because I think they were watching how serious the Japanese government is in liberalizing agriculture. Um, um, it, it has been said it's a priority of the Abe government as part of the third arrow. Um, if they were serious about the third arrow and structural reforms, they would use the Australian bilateral agreement, they'd use the TPP and any other um, agreements to make strong commitments externally to deliver what they want to deliver at home. And I think there's a, a lack of evidence in that in, in the TPP so far with the trying to negotiate and give up as little as possible um, in these negotiations as opposed to realizing, well, we want to open up our agriculture and services sectors. Here's a good vehicle to help us do that with a bit of pressure from the outside. So in that context, in the context of this morning's conversation, the conversation this afternoon uh, about uh, uh, the structural reform agenda in Japan and also about the politics of structural reform in Japan, especially on agriculture, do you think uh, that Australia made the wrong call and backed away from the negotiation too early, yielded too quickly on the deal it did with Japan and the bilateral FTA, or, or should we have hung in there for... Uh, bigger access in the context of the leverage that the TPP negotiations mm -hmm. might bring to bear on, on, oh, on that's, access? That's a, it's a, a really difficult question to, <laughs> to answer. Um, I, I think it was right to, to strike the deal when we could. Um, we don't know how long the TPP negotiations would last. And in the end, it'll come down to a bilateral negotiation between Australia and Japan, Australia and the United States on market access anyway. That's the way that the TPP is being structured. So. If we can get a deal early, which we did, um, that brings in, um, and hope, I think there's talk about uh, implementing before April 1st next year, in that case, um, liberalize agriculture twice next year, we'll get two big chunks next year. I think, you know, you take what you can get um, when you can get it, and that was a, a good sign. I think they seized the opportunity, and there's nothing like a, a good political relationship between our two prime ministers to, to help that happen. So we can declare victory on that front. <laughs> Amy, uh, what about uh, the security uh, declaration? Mm -hmm. uh, the one in 2006? Seven, yeah. Seven, yeah. Yes, yeah. and uh, this year. Uh, what's the substance mm -hmm. of that from the viewpoint of deepening and broadening mm -hmm. the security relationship between Australia and Japan? Mm -hmm. Well, as Professor Sawyer already mentioned, the 2007 agreement focused largely, largely on non-traditional areas of cooperation, things that weren't particularly controversial, if you like, to other neighbours in the region, weren't particularly controversial for Japan at home. I think what we're seeing now is, is sort of a move more into the traditional end of that uh, security cooperation. Um, I would say that I think a lot of the, um, the closer security ties uh, are happening at the rhetorical level at the moment. You know, we saw very soon after Prime Minister Abbott came to power, Lots of new language about uh, Japan as Australia's best friend in Asia, uh, an, an ally, albeit one with a small A, apparently. Um, and, you know, very strong support for um, Abe's uh, uh, efforts to revise or reinterpret um, the constitution around collective self-defence. Um, so strong, strong rhetorical support from Australia on all of those things. In terms of sort of practical substance, what we're, what we're seeing um, is a new agreement on um, uh, exchange of defence uh, technology and science um, and sort of practical cooperation, particularly in sort of maritime technology. Uh, we're seeing new um, uh, air, ground and naval exercises between the two militaries. Um, most of those are actually trilateral, so they involve the US as well. So they're not necessarily just exclusively at the bilateral level, but are linking up sort of the three points of the alliance, if you like. Um, and, you know, we may see an agreement on submarines. Um, we've, uh, Defence Minister Johnson's in Tokyo at the moment um, and has reportedly uh, formally asked Japan for assistance with Australia's submarine program, although it's still, there are still reservations about exactly what we will commit to and we're holding open the possibility of, uh, of uh, a domestic deal or, a, you know, a, another uh, European... Uh, submarine deal. So, you know, I guess it's watched this space in terms of um, tangible uh, cooperation and, and exchange of technology in that regard. Yoshi, uh, do you share Amy's view of where the thing's at at the moment? And uh, what about going forward with this uh, uh, agreement or declaration? Yeah, I think that's clearly the direction which our relationship is taking. Uh, uh, but, but uh, of course, there is a, another 
question, to what extent we can go. And uh, as far as uh, that you know, kind of limit uh, goes, uh, I, I don't think, uh, for instance, so what uh, Dick Samuel said, kind of, you know, uh, slippery slope school arguments are not, not right. I mean, uh, we're not gonna go that far. And, uh, but uh, if you expect too much uh, out of this, I think you, you tend to be kind of disappointed. So I think the important thing between Australia and Japan is to have a clear sort of conceptual agreement or framework mm -hmm. and for what purposes you know, we are doing this. And rather than simply getting excited about the expansion of you know, the, the margin of our cooperation. And uh, I think in that sense, uh, security declaration uh, this year as well as 2007 are very indicative of the nature of our cooperation. Uh, first of all, this is not a cooperation on traditional security domains. I don't think this has any element of, for instance, balancing against anybody, for that matter, uh, China, most importantly. And uh, it doesn't have perhaps any serious elements of uh, working with the US, for instance, in the traditional domain. I mean, the substance of Australia-Japan cooperation. <coughs> and I kind of hesitate to, to say this, because, uh, but uh, it's a, but I have to say at mm. one point, it's Please. a typical middle power security cooperation. <laughs> 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 you know, uh, I think substance <laughs> is a typical middle power security cooperation in you know, multilateral security, non-traditional security issues, disaster relief, you know, and, and so forth. And so conceptually, we should be very explicit about that in well, order not to create unnecessary <laughs> you know, sort of disturbances mm -hmm. out of this. I guess there's middle power and middle power security cooperation. There's different kinds of middle power security cooperation. Uh, and just picking up uh, Amy's observation about the nature of the um, activities that are encouraged under this uh, cooperation agreement. Uh, basically, uh, let, I hesitate to say this too, but I, would, I guess uh, our political leaders in Australia in, in carrying us forward with this persuaded us fairly convincingly to see this cooperation through the prism of the US alliance relationship from this perspective. So how does that play yeah, 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 in, before, in yeah. Japan? Yeah, I think there are two, two aspects of our security cooperation. One, with, one aspect has to do with working with the US. And, and this has more elements of traditional security, I think. Uh, the, how to engage the US or how to kind of streamline our alliances you know, uh, with the US between Australia and Japan. And, uh, and so, so the, the, this, this triangle has elements of traditional security. But the kind of you know, bilateral security uh, cooperation, so I think this, this is kind of different. And I think we are engaging in those two sort of you know, different levels of security games. But my, my point is uh, uh, kind of traditional aspect of, of you know, wor working with Americans. Uh, again, this has to be managed very carefully and very strategically, but uh, I don't think there is much that you know, Australia and Japan can add, I mean, to this, except to, to, to make the US presence here more effective, functional. And for instance, Japanese-Australian military cooperation with Americans <coughs> in order for them to you know, uh, exercise their power. I think that's kind of too much mm. to expect. And that, I don't think that's happening. So, so th these two dimensions should be, I think, conceptually you know, ex uh, distinguished. Mm. And, uh, and, and in engaging in those two level, you know, kind of diplomacy, I think this difference should be uh, more explicitly, I think, uh, uh, appreciated. Yeah. Amy, you wanted to come in on that? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think, I think this, this question of expectations is really important. And I think uh, there is a lack of clarity around that at the moment. And partly it's because political leaders get excited and they talk in much more expansive language than perhaps the policy makers uh, are ready for or believe is actually realistic um, or that the institutions themselves are prepared for. 
But language of alliances and security partners, you know, that, that, that means something, or it could potentially mean something. And I think we need to, to think seriously about um, whether or not it's, it's a slippery slope metaphor or something else, whether or not we are sort of sliding in that direction. And that's something that, you know, we should, we should be publicly debating. Um, a colleague of mine, Brendan Taylor, has, has just produced uh, a report uh, that will be launched next month uh, here at the ANU looking at what uh, Australia-Japan security cooperation means in terms of potential Australian contribution in the event of a conflict, not a war, but a, some kind of crisis or uh, small-scale conflict in the East China Sea. Uh, and I think that's the sort of thinking that we need to be engaging in. Um, and as, as I guess a second point I just raise is, um, you know, during Prime Minister Abe's speech in the Australian Parliament, he didn't speak all that much about the US alliance. It was much more about Australia and Japan cooperation. And, and I think that was quite interesting. Um, so, you know, to what extent is this about a contribution to the US alliance or is this about something uh, separate to the US alliance? Um, as we know, the US and Japan are currently in the process of ref revising their uh, defence guidelines. And I think it'll be important for Australians to watch that space and see, you know, what that might mean for you know, trilateral cooperation in the region. As you say, uh, the debate is yet to be had to some extent, although you see elements of the debate starting to emerge now with some of our political leaders defining what it does and doesn't mean in their terms, even if not uh, uh, as the government might see it. Uh, just coming back to that issue, uh, though, Yoshi, you mentioned uh, we should be careful about uh, the expectations that that Amy uh, emphasised as well as being very important. Uh, mm -hmm. what, what would inhibit, uh, in particular in Japan, uh, the development of a closer security relationship uh, of both kinds between Australia and Japan, would you say? I think in practical terms and, uh, <coughs> and between the two administrations, I mean, in charge of uh, th this affair, there, there should be no, you know, major concern or constraint. <coughs> I think uh, the, the trend is, I think, to do more. I think that's that's what's being, I would assume, discussed, you know, between bureaucrats or those those people in, in charge of these affairs, and uh, and so in that sense, I, I I don't think there is much concern or constraint. And uh, if there is a constraint, I think uh, this was the case of 2007 and, and AXA, I think. Australian side expected more from Japan, Want, wanted Japan to do more. But Japan couldn't because of its you know, very usual, well-known constraints. So if you really read the document, you know, it's, it's not such a big deal. <laughs> you know, just, uh, you know, mutually supplying waters or containment <laughs> or, you know, and uh, those kind of things. And, uh, but unless there is such an agreement in document, of course, the two militaries cannot, yeah. you know, operate on the same grounds. So in that sense, this is very significant. You know, it allowed both militaries to work together. But if you look into the substance, it's, it's not really such a big deal. And uh, so, so constraints are uh, there, I mean, uh, mostly coming from the Japanese side, you know, Australia Air Force is now bombing, you know, ISIS, <laughs> but uh, I cannot imagine that they would come ever for Japan in, in the foreseeable future, or for, for many, many, many years to come. So, so, so that itself is a constraint. And, uh, and perhaps when you ask the question, you may have had some aspects of Japanese domestic, you know, constraints uh, or resistance. Uh, Again, if you look at the substance, I, think I, I don't expect that. But if, if there is such a thing, this would come from sort of different level of uh, concerns, particularly maybe uh, from the fact that this is uh, Prime Minister Abe himself, who is enthusiastic about this expansion of Japan's security role. And it, 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 Prime Minister Abe involving, being involved in this kind of affair uh, may tend to create certain image, right? And, uh, and that certain image, of course, is a dominant image, uh, I think, held by, for instance, uh, Japanese immediate neighbors, and uh, Chinese, and maybe South Koreans, too. And uh, so, so that complicates, I think, this business. 
but but uh, this is different. This this difficulty is quite different from difficulty innately there. I mean, in the security relationship between Japan and Australia, and uh, so so that's that's one possible real real uh, you mean uh, kind of uh, constraint if if there is, and uh, but that's that's very different from again the substance of the security cooperation. I'll take this question that Amy mentioned, which is uh, the possibility of some kind of purchase, substantial military purchase uh, from Japan, either technology or equipment. Uh, you know, if we were, I mean, I'm, I'm one of those in Australia who believes we should buy our submarines from someone. So we shouldn't make them here because it's very expensive <laughs> to make them here. So, uh, and there is this uh, loose discussion of uh, the possibility of buying them from Japan. Uh, how would that play out in, in Japan? I think, uh, again, a slippery slope school would make the usual argument. But I myself, advocate of middle power strategy, <coughs> is not very much worried, I think. But, but I don't think our relationship would go that far. Japan selling submarine to Australia, still I cannot imagine, it, as an actual policy. I don't know. If Prime Minister Abe decides to do this, how domestic responses would be, this might go. Uh, uh, but, uh, so I may be wrong, but you know, that's a, it's not really a sea change, but according to a certain, from a certain perspective, it's a huge change in Japanese security policies. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, it's a matter of uh, perception, you know, uh, rather than substance of security cooperation. And uh, Japan engaging in technological cooperation with foreign countries, I mean, uh, military technology, I mean, again, that's not a big deal. I mean, that's a, that's a usual practice of, you know, all the countries <laughs> in the world. And when I went to Sweden some time ago, Swedish defense industry people wanted to develop this, you know, uh, the military technology cooperation with Japan, you know, the, uh, tremendously. And uh, so Japan working with Sweden, you know, in jointly, working on you know, military technology, again, again, it's not a big deal. It's a usual thing. And so for us to become familiar with this kind of thing, it's, 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 again, it's not a small issue as far as Japanese audience is concerned. And, and it's not a small issue as far as Japanese neighbors are concerned, perhaps. So, so again, here, the same issue. I mean, the gap between substance of you know, security cooperation and uh, in particular, uh, certain per perceptions about Japan engaging in these kind of new, new business. Uh, what about this issue from an Australian perspective? Mm. Uh, how does it play into our various interests mm. domestically and in the region mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, more broadly, yeah. Amy? Mm. Well, I mean, on the submarine thing, I'd also just sort of make the point that, um, I mean, I think there is, from what I understand, quite a bit of concern just within the uh, defense science community within Japan about technology, technology sharing. Yeah. And so I think, you know, while we might all support the idea of technology sharing from an economic standpoint, um, there, you know, Japan hasn't had a history of doing that necessarily. And so uh, there are concerns there. But, I, you know, I think um, there are a lot of big debates on the, um, the submarine issue that still need to be wrestled with. with. Cost is one, obviously, but uh, not just the, the, you know, the price tag when you purchase the thing, but the lifetime cost of maintaining that. Uh, which is something we don't know enough about from the uh, from the Japanese side, um, the in, sort of the long-term endurance uh, of the of the ship and their ability to sort of patrol for uh, long distances. That's a particular concern for Australia, being as we are at the other end of the world. Um, the ability to, to put American uh, combat platforms onto Japanese submarines or whomever submarines we purchase. Uh, so there's lots of sort of big issues there around the capabilities that we that we might want from these things. Then there's, of course, the whole domestic labour uh, argument as well, which has been um, a big deal for um, uh, the Labour Party. And we, we, we heard, um, I think, quite an unfortunate speech um, by Bill Shorten in, in my own hometown uh, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago, which uh, sort of harked back to kind of a militaristic um, history there that we uh, wouldn't... Uh, I think is, is an unhelpful way of talking about the Australia-Japan relationship, but does speak to, uh, I guess, the domestic manufacturing sector um, 
So there's, there's lots of big debates there that, that politicians you know, are going to have to wrestle with and I don't think um, we are quite clear yet on where that, that's going to go. I want to talk with you a bit more about uh, repositioning the relationship going forward uh, and then I want to throw it open to the audience because I'm sure there are a lot of questions out here that uh, uh, will encourage uh, a broader discussion uh, of the potential of the relationship. Uh, but uh, Shiro, just going back to you for a minute on where we're at and potentially going forward, one of the big uh, positives in the relationship on the economic side in recent years has been uh, the big surge of investment uh, interest and uh, of course the agreement that's just been signed uh, uh, elevated uh, the opening for ready Japanese investment in the Australian economy and the investment thing is, of course is not untied not only to the bilateral relationship but also uh, our positioning with Japan's business uh, in the regional economy. Uh, uh, that, uh, again, uh, changed our relationship, brought it on a par with uh, the relationship that was established on the investment side under the US agreement. Uh, how do you see that going forward uh, in the economic relationship? You, you're right. I, I didn't talk about the lifting of the investment threshold. <coughs> so. So now the threshold has been lifted from 250 odd million to $1 billion um, before it has to be screened by our Foreign Investment Review Board. So it's a liberalization, significant liberalization, um, quadrupling of the threshold for Japanese investment into Australia. Um, but this, this sort of gives it equal treatment to uh, the United States and New Zealand and South Korea. We got this in the South Korean agreement. Um, and it's expected that the same will happen with the Australia-China agreement um, when that gets finalized. And so this is uh, it's negating some discrimination Australia faced relative to US uh, investment from the United States, investment from New Zealand, um, and potentially from South Korea and China. Um, but I, I think on that front, given that we've liberalized our threshold, our investment threshold, to these preferred partners, I think it's time to think about lifting the threshold unilaterally um, for the Foreign Investment Review Board. That, that's another issue, but it is a significant part of the EPA um, and uh, for Japanese investment into Australia. The, the other thing you mentioned is about um, how that helps Japanese companies, not just in Australia, but in the region. Um, and something important that I think about in, in terms of repositioning the bilateral relationship, um, both Japan and Australia have China is our number one economic partner, our most important economic partner, and Asia is, is where our economic bread is buttered, Asia more broadly. Because um, it's not just a China relationship, it's, it's complex supply chains and production networks. Um, so Australia and Japan's interests are in deepening that economic interdependence in Asia um, and across the Trans-Pacific uh, with the United States. And so um, I don't understand a lot of the the hard political, security, um, military cooperation, but I do believe um, that is e talked about much easier. It's, it's easier to discuss these um, zero-sum issues, the political security issues, in a context of, of a more interdependent um, economic relationship, um, not just bilaterally, but, but with more partners. Um, so there's a positive sum element to economic cooperation that, that I think helps on, on these political security issues. And if I might just go a little further, um, I think one of the achievements, uh, significant achievements, significant achievements of Australia-Japan um, in diplomacy was the creation of APEC, uh, very much led by <coughs> Australia and Japan. Um, <laughs> in, <laughs> in, in helping um, create a broad framework in the region for economic cooperation. And I think we're at a time where we, we are looking for something like that, again, um, we have the TPP, RCEP um, agreements uh, in Australia and Japan are in both. And so it's about um, fashioning these to have a, a broader, more inclusive um, r uh, economic cooperation uh, arrangement in the region. Well, let's talk a bit about going forward, both on the economic side and the political security side. So, you know, APEX uh, out there, it's part of the framework. Uh, but we've got the TPP under negotiation, uh, and we've got this broader regional comprehensive economic partnership uh, under negotiation as well. 
uh, Australia and Japan are b involved in both of them. Uh, and as was discussed earlier, uh, and as the Mexican minister said in Washington yesterday, very much the TPP has turned into uh, a giant Japan-US FTA negotiation. So how do you see uh, us taking our cooperation forward beyond the foundation that's been laid in the partnership agreement that we signed this year in that context? Mm -hmm. mm. Sure, well, um, the TPP involves a number of Asia-Pacific economies. It doesn't in involve China, India, Indonesia. It doesn't involve Australia and, and Japan, as you mentioned, and the United States. And then the RCEP agreement, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, involves the ASEAN plus six, or the ASEAN plus Japan, China, Korea, India, New Zealand, and Australia, but doesn't involve the United States. Now, if these agreements get concluded um, and exclude important economic and political partners in the region, like the United States on one hand, Indonesia, China on the other, um, they're not so helpful for, for economic cooperation. I mean, these, especially the US-China relationship, having two separate frameworks, two separate agreements that have different rules governing them um, is not congenial to, to helping the, the bilateral relationship. So I think with Australia and Japan in both, it's, it's a matter of having, uh, making them less exclusionary um, and over time so that there's an opportunity for these other countries to join, to make them more inclusive and, and um, make you know, operationalize the open accession clauses that are supposedly in both of these agreements. Amy. Mm. Sorry to jump in. Is there, is there a sign that Japan is keen to make these agreements less exclusionary? I think we're hearing that in Australia, perhaps, but I, I'm curious about the Japan situation. Um, I, I, I don't know and I don't think so from what I can see. I, I think the priority now is, is hunkering down in a, a bilateral negotiation with the United States on, on market access. And, and that's priority number one. Um, and it appears, as I said before, giving up as little as possible. So I think there's not much thinking, I don't think there's much thinking in the region more broadly, but in Japan about making these agreements inclusive over time and more open to, to um, other members. But, uh, so, you, you, you're not backing away from the TPP negotiation, are you? When you say backing away? Well, you, you're not, we, you're not discounting that as a, as a major platform for deepening regional cooperation, are you? Well, it doesn't include China, Indonesia, a, a number of other partners in the region. Um, um, so I find that problematic if, if it... But it deals with the big issues between Japan and the United States. Yep. yep. So uh, and that's an important the priority, the top priority in Japan is clearly on that at the moment. Yeah, but I think when that's done, mm. then what next? Mm. And I think then uh, the focus has to be on this regional comprehensive economic partnership um, that includes its neighbours, um, as well as the complementary Japan-China-Korea trilateral agreement. Mm. Um, so I think, you know, while the focus now is very symbolic, political, politically hot, TPP um, is what everyone's focused on. I think that's not the only game in town. And, and while that's important to get done, um, I think it's, it's worth thinking about moving forward after that. And, and there are other agreements and other frameworks that, that do need attention after that. So you mentioned earlier that uh, you know, Australia and Japan did work really very closely together diplomatically uh, and uh, economically in uh, setting the APEC framework up. Uh, do you see similar opportunities for Japan and Australia to work closely together uh, in this broader Asian economic cooperation arrangement? Uh, most definitely, yeah. Um, um, that was a, a time when everyone was trying to deal with Japan's rise and, and, and really deepen cooperation beyond what existed, which was basically um, we didn't have frameworks to talk about these things um, region-wide. Um, we have a few more now, actually, if we have a fair few. We've got the East Asia Summit, um, that's less <coughs> focus on the economics. We have existing APEC framework, um, but I think given the need for deeper cooperation and, and regional integration, um, as many of these countries are proposing these binding agreements such as RCEP and TPP, 
And so, and it's not decided. No one knows what the, the region's going to look like, what these arrangements are going to look like five years hence, um, let alone next year. Um, I think it's, there is a strong bilateral, but also beyond bilateral um, platform to work from in, in shaping these from the inside. I'm going to hand it over to the audience in a minute to pose some questions to the panellists, but before I do, just uh, let's reflect upon uh, what might be the potential shape uh, of uh, the security political relationship between Australia and Japan going forward. Uh, Yoshi, you hinted that uh, uh, there were significant opportunities to develop uh, uh, a serious political security relationship between the two countries which would assist the interests of both countries. Would you like to say a little bit more about ideally how you'd like to see that evolve? Mm. Well, uh, again, this is my middle power concept, sorry, uh, repeating this. Uh, I think what's been achieved... I know who thought and, of that term. And this, <laughs> what's been achieved and is to be achieved between Japan and Australia should be uh, regionalized, regionalized, shouldn't be kept just between ourselves. And uh, theoretically, in practice, it's not going to happen, unfortunately. But there are seeds and potentials there, real potentials, is to, to involve South Korea. Uh, Australia and South Korea, I understand, have much more comprehensive security agreements. And in fact, uh, AXA too, I guess, you, you have AXA between the two militaries. And Japan and South Korea came very close to agreeing to AXA uh, uh, during the Myeongbuk administration. And I hear that document is almost complete. Uh, but they are simultaneously negotiating uh, Military Information Act. And, uh, and that was complete. But the signing was postponed because of the political developments. Uh, and so, uh, so trilateralizing this sort of you know, typical middle power cooperation among Japan, South Korea, Australia, I think in, th in theory at least there are potentials there. And uh, it's, it's up to political environment and, the, and, and the political leadership. And um, so, so I think in that sense, we, we can lead. Maybe we can repeat what we did in creating APEC in more political and security domain. It's a, it's a regional multilateral cooperation. I mean, that's, that's the game. What, right? would the, yeah. what would the shape, you know, tangibly, what would the shape of such a cooperation arrangement look well, like? Well, for, for instance, having trilateral AXA among Japan, Australia, South Korea and three militaries engaging in the same sort of, you know, uh, peacekeeping or uh, disaster relief activities. I think that's a beautiful scene. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I think that's possible. I think that's possible. Uh, there, there are potential. And, and uh, maybe, it can, and this, again, uh, this is not ganging, ganging up against China, of course. This has no elements of balancing. It has elements of creating regional infrastructure of multilateral security cooperation, which is terribly lacking. And I think uh, Japan and Australia are the kind of best partners in promoting such a new regional initiative in political and security domain. So that, that's, in a way, a repetition of APEC in, in, a, in a different domain. So yeah. It'll have to be done with a lot of diplomacy. Yes, clearly, yeah. so it doesn't yeah. send the wrong signals. That's right, exactly, exactly. So, so in that sense, political leadership matter, I think, very much. How you present this, and uh, I'm not sure whether the current leaders are per perfectly fit or not. I, I would not comment, but uh, that's that's very important. I think. Amy, would you like to add to that? Well, that's probably a nice place to, to pick up. I mean, political leadership and selling this is is critically important. And Prime Minister Abe has been very active in in selling his message to certain countries in the region. He's been very active in Southeast Asia and here in Australia, in India and elsewhere. But the two key countries that he needs to really sell that to uh, are China and South Korea. Mm. Um, and one, a great piece by Ben Asioni in the uh, most recent quarterly that's just been launched today um, picks up on this point. Um, you know, over the last 20 years, the regional sort of security pact has been based on this idea of engaging with China, getting the benefits out of China's rise, but also hedging against the risks that China's rise might pose. And we're seeing, I think, a sharper turn towards the hedging side of that, 
largely because of China's behaviour over the last little while. Now, the problem is, though, when we, we can't move completely to the hedging side. We, we're not in the Cold War, for all the reasons that Shiro's pointed out. We need that economic engagement with China. The region all depends on it, uh, Australia and everyone else. Um, so we need, we need some kind of uh, renewed pact, some new, this new diplomacy, new ideas about how this region will, will exist, and in most importantly, I think, how the two great powers in this region, China and Japan, can actually happily coexist. Um, well, well, let me throw a bit of a damp squib on this, uh, Yoshi. I was in Japan, as you know, over the last week or so, and I was talking to a really quite senior Japanese strategic analyst there, and basically he said to me, uh, all this middle power diplomacy is gone from Japan. We're in a different period now. We're in a different era. Has never been there. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder, would you say that was the, the right judgment? Has never taken root. I, mean, I think I'm the only one who is arguing. <laughs> well, let's uh, throw it open to the audience for some questions now. And uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions. Uh, uh, and uh, please direct it to anyone you wish to or the panel as a whole. <coughs> yeah, number one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Kensuke Yoshida, political minister of the Embassy of Japan in Canberra. Uh, uh, thank you for the panels, uh, for a fascinating conversation. Uh, uh, this is rather a comment than a question. Uh, one of the aspects that deserves more attention in our Australia-Japan common endeavors uh, is maintenance and developing of uh, rules-based order. Uh, surely this is not a uh, bilateral uh, endeavor, but uh, endeavor uh, shared by the like-minded countries. But uh, uh, since uh, Japan and Australia are two of the exemplary international citizen, uh, citizens, uh, we rightly deserve to uh, take leadership in this endeavor. Uh, when we say Japan and Australia share the same uh, strategic vision and interests, I think uh, we mean that uh, we share the vision uh, of the world or international order that we wish to comfortably live in. Uh, that's the world, or it, that is the world order, uh, open and liberal, uh, fair and equitable, uh, predictable and stable, uh, in which uh, rule of law prevails uh, and the uh, countries or actors are not uh, invited or uh, misled to misbehave or misuse power to uh, achieve its uh, strategic uh, goals, resorting to uh, use of force or uh, coercive uh, measures. Uh, so uh, uh, we can uh, work together to strengthen the uh, uh, rule of law, especially in the uh, Asia-Pacific region. And that is what uh, Prime Minister Abe advocated when he delivered uh, his keynote speech at Shangri-La Dialogue uh, this year. So uh, I think that's one of the uh, aspects of our two countries' cooperation uh, deserves more attention. Thank yeah, you. I think that's a comment, but I think it also carries a question with it which would be useful to have some comment on. I want to extend the question part of it in a way because a rules-based order has to do with uh, the, uh, uh, the upholding of hard law, hard international law in various ways and various conventions and norms on the political side. It also has to do uh, with uh, upholding uh, the rules and norms of the international economic system, uh, which are also in a state of uh, fluidity uh, for a number of reasons, and which, of course, the framework uh, of the G20, uh, the summit of which we're hosting here in Australia this year, uh, is directed uh, its attention to uh, in the short term and, and hopefully more in the longer term. So from both the political side, uh, Amy or, or Yoshi, and, and from the economic side, I wonder if you'd like to respond uh, to this comment question. Amy. Sure. Mm. Um, I mean, I completely agree. There's, there's, there's been a huge um, appetite for this phrase, rule of law, in the last year or so, not only in Japan, but also in China, where Xi Jinping... Uh, very frequently refers to the rule of law, although I think it means something quite different. Um, <laughs> I think, you know, I, 
Rules-based order is a lovely phrase, partly because it's quite ambiguous, and it's ambiguous um, when we drill down to, to what we actually mean and what kinds of rules we're talking about. And when we're talking about, for instance, things like freedom of navigation um, and surveillance activities in territorial waters and all these kinds of things, states in the region interpret those rules and norms differently. Um, so I would absolutely agree with you, we do need more discourse about that. But, uh, and to be blunt, it needs to involve not just the, the partners that normally talk to each other, but it also needs to involve China as well, because we can't, I don't think we can assume that dictating rules to China will, will solve any problems. We need to actually get these actors on the same page uh, to agree on what they actually mean by um, various rules. Well, but this is clearly <laughs> true also on the economic side, unless all the partners are involved in rule and norm formation, uh, then there's no adherence. And unless you have everybody in the room, some of whom are going to be quite difficult to talk to in the initial phase of this process, then you're not going to get any effective rules and norms. Josh, would you want to co comment on that? Uh, not the yeah, economic side, well, the political side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think uh, I cannot think of anybody who would disagree with the importance of this. <laughs> and uh, so how, how to put this into practice as sort of regional infrastructure? I think there should be those initiatives. And, uh, and uh, in the end, um, engaging China is, of course, very important. And uh, in, in this sort of evolution of you know, uh, making rule of law and other values as foundations of uh, Asia-Pacific order. And, but I don't think uh, our Prime Minister included, uh, we have not yet you know, uh, reached that sort of level of operationalizing this concept necessarily. And, and if, as, as long as this is taken as an uh, uh, expression of sort of uh, uh, countermeasures against, against Chinese, somewhat, you know, uh, what we see as aggressive actions, uh, to some extent, this has some merits. But I think there are limits. And uh, I, I don't think we have gone through those limits necessarily. And That's it. And the, well, well, one thing, uh, okay, I will just pass. <laughs> yeah. sure, on the economic side, we have a, a global framework um, um, through the WTO, the, the multilateral trading system, that has rules for trade, um, global rules for trade that, that all members sign up to when they join. And these have served um, us very well in the, in the, since uh, World War II. Um, they've underpinned mm -hmm. confidence in, in economic exchange between countries. Um, and trade has grown rapidly um, and allowed countries to open up with confidence, um, knowing that other countries have signed on to these rules and signed up to these constraints. Uh, so I do worry about you know, the stalling of the Doha round in the WTO. <coughs> um, the lack of further liberalization has given a lot of countries um, sort of, not the green light, but they've used it as an, as an excuse to, to do some of the rulemaking outside of the global framework in bilaterals, but importantly, regional agreements like the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This is more about rule setting than market access, um, really. Um, and the problem with fragmenting the rules of global trade um, and having different rules for different partners is, I, I think, a, a really good example of, of how important the global trade rules are um, comes to a, a lot of work I've been doing with Amy on um, Chinese rare earth metals. Um, so this is, uh, everyone's familiar with the case of, of s the Chinese supposedly um, stopping exports of rare earth metals to Japan, which China has a monopoly in producing 97% global supply. Um, um, after a, a, a Senkaku Diaoyu um, um, flare up, um, supposedly um, these exports were stopped, and these exports are very important for Japan in high-tech um, manufactures, um, high-end high goods that J Japan relies on to export. And instead of whatever you think happened, whether there was a trade embargo or not, there's, there's very little evidence for there being a trade embargo. In fact, there's no evidence we can find. Um, this wasn't resolved um, by Japan, the United States, and Europe, and other economies putting, you know, escalating, um, um, stopping trade with China or retaliating, it was settled in the WTO. Um, the dispute settlement mechanism is very active still, very robust, um, and China 
abided by the finding that it actually slowed down exports of rare earths um, to try to consolidate its own domestic industry. So this is an important example of, of where the global trading system um, can help resolve issues um, peacefully um, in, a, in a respected body. And, and these are constraints and rules that China and others signed up to voluntarily um, in their accession to the WTO. Uh, there's a bigger issue there in uh, areas beyond these particular rules in the G G20, but we'll leave that for a moment and, and uh, ask for some more questions. Who would like them? Okay, Hasegawa, here in the middle. And then... <coughs> Uh, Koichi Hasegawa uh, from Tohoku University. Uh, my question is, how about uh, uh, the civil society level, uh, Australia and Japan's citizens' uh, relationship? Uh, in case of uh, Japan and mainland China, and uh, in case of South Korea and uh, mainland China, uh, no, no. Uh, uh, in South Korea and Japan, uh, in, in both cases, we have a lot of NGO and uh, civil societies uh, activities to exchange. How about uh, in uh, the relationship between Australia and Japan? Can you show some uh, special uh, uh, activities to include uh, understanding each other. I'll let the panel have a go at that first, but then I'll ask Murray to come in on that because uh, he's been deeply involved for a number of years as ambassador uh, in the relationship. Uh, would you like to start? Uh, uh, I'd, I'd maybe hand over to Shiro. Yoshi? <laughs> oh, sorry, Yoshi, Yoshi, sorry. Well, my, my, my kind of personal uh, involvement or experience uh, has to do with uh, the program which uh, Mitsui Trading Company is organizing here in Australia. They are giving, uh, it is a f scholarship, or they invite a group of uh, select Australian university students to Japan for a month or so. And uh, I've been inviting them in, in my class, one of my classes every year. And we are going to do this in December this year also, uh, having discussions among, you know, between students. And uh, discussions are very beautiful. <laughs> and uh, and you know, very, very productive mm -hmm. and just confirms the, the importance you know, of commonalities of their, of course, values, preferences, and uh, exchanging views about East Asia and regional affairs, and uh, no obstacle whatsoever. And uh, so it's very natural. Yeah. Uh, but, but I don't know to what extent how many uh, those activities are being conducted, but I just happen to be. And, uh, sponsoring one sure. Of them. Yeah, mm. yeah I, I think there is a lot that is happening, um, and I'll, I'll defer to Murray McLean to, to give you a broader picture. Um, but um, I, I learnt that just last week we signed our 109th sister city relationship between a, a Australian and Japanese city or um, region. So that's pretty significant. Um, we have a lot of exchange programs. Um, in fact, I have an announcement here to make. I was waiting for the final session, but now seems a fitting time. Um, the JET program, the Japan Exchange and Teaching Program, um, which is, sends a lot of students, from, students, graduates from Australia to Japan to teach, um, has an information night next Monday night here at ANU. <laughs> <laughs> and Matt French over there um, has more information for anyone who's interested. So there's a huge... Uh, civil society interaction between the two countries. Murray, if you could say a little bit about that briefly. Yeah, look, I, I won't take too much time. Uh, it's been effectively said already because, um, but I'd like to make one point, and that is that in terms of our relationships, that is Australia's relationships with Asian countries, I think the level of community and civil society uh, relationships is second to none. Um, the reason this has been going solidly now for 50 plus years and uh, it's, it was all part of the reconciliation process between Australia and Japan in the post-war period and uh, as very much integral to the growth of the uh, bilateral relationship um, 
which was usually seen in headlines as the economic relationship, but the underpinning of it has always been a very, very active uh, community uh, level of relationship between school visits. I mean, I think there was something like 60 or 70,000 Japanese uh, school children, that is not uh, university level um, uh, students, coming to Australia every year for a week or two. Um, that's the most that uh, Japan sends to any country. Um, and uh, Australians, uh, through these sister city relationships and provincial relationships and state to prefectural relationships have been going on for a long time. I think the challenge really in the future um, is that this level of activity can not only be sustained but to continue to grow because, um, let's face it, the um, uh, news out there for young people is that China's the game and um, it's important that um, uh, Australia, young Australians do have associations with China, but it's very important not to drop the Japan level of connections that we have at the community level because it's brought so many, uh, you know, through the JET program, which of course is a Japanese initiative, there are many people in government and in our embassies and, and other universities who've been through this program. It's been a highly successful program. And that's part of the thinking behind the current government's uh, new Colombo plan that uh, young Australians, more young Australians, will go up to Japan at the university level uh, and include a secondment in uh, industry or wherever. And that's all very important, I think, uh, because if you don't have the trust and the understanding at the grassroots level, then you can't do bigger things, such as free trade agreements or, or security or strategic relationships. One of the first countries, well, the first country that Australia put in place a working holiday program with was Japan. And similarly, the first country that Japan put a, in place a working holiday program was with Australia. That's also played a very important role in uh, extending uh, the civil relations between our two countries. I should just, uh, uh, I should, as the chair of the Australia Japan Foundation, say that that's the whole point of, <laughs> whole point of our organisation. Just um, the propaganda. Uh, <laughs> program, yeah. um, and we give about 40 grants a year and we get about 150 patients and they're always very high quality and it's all about trying to foster non-government community and other levels of relationships. Uh, let's take uh, one or two questions before unfortunately we have to co close this session. Um, yep, there's one up the back here. Well, and one my, my name is Fuad Garuta, I'm a physicist, I'm not a politician. I have a question, I mean you, you have been mentioning the necessity of economic growth, uh, economic cooperation in Asia including China. On the other hand, when we talk strategic and military things, we are excluding China for an obvious reason. How do you think we can go with these two lines in parallel? And second, if we look at what happened in East Ukraine in the last period with Russia, uh, do you think this is not giving some wings or will give some wings to China to create some incident, major incident in Asia? also to divert the, the Chinese population from what is happening in Hong Kong now. Uh, any last question? And we're questioned out, we'll throw that, those two questions over to the panel. Who'd like to start? start? Yep. Amy? I'll jump in. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a great question and it's beautifully phrased. We, the answer is we can't. We can't afford for uh, our economics to move in one direction and our security to move in the other. Uh, partly because the economic relationship is just so important, uh, but also because we don't, we, we can't slide into a war. You know, we don't want that uh, scenario to, uh, to unfold. Um, and I think that's why so many of us are concerned um, about the Japan, the state of the Japan-China relationship, um, albeit one that you know in the last few months does seem to be sort of improving slightly, and there you know is likely to be a meeting in, in November. I think the fundamentals of that relationship are profoundly unhealthy. Um, at a time when, as Professor Samuels has mentioned, Japan is trying to escape from the post-war uh, in its national identity, uh, the Xi Jinping government is clinging very tightly to this idea of um, maintaining the post-war order in which Japan was given a very specific role as a non-normal military power. Uh, and all the references that we hear coming out of China to the Cairo Declaration, the Potsdam Declaration, uh, are sort of symbols of that. Um, I've done some research uh, earlier this year on 
China's new idea of uh, a new type of great power relations with the US, which is great, but it doesn't talk at all about Japan, and that's a real problem. Um, and so, you know, I think the, the goal has to be for, uh, for those of us in Australia uh, who care about this regional relationship um, to, to do all we can to try and um, work out ways to get those two states to engage in that mutual reckoning process. Not an easy goal, um, which is why I'm glad I'm, I'm an academic and not a policymaker. <laughs> Want to add to that, sure? Mm. Yeah, um, look, on the first question, um, I think uh, for a starting point, it's important to have dialogue and, and cooperation to minimise the misunderstandings and, and minimise the risk. And when you don't have leaders meeting um, and you have you know, bad relations between Japan and China, for example, and that doesn't help. Um, and so I mentioned before having you know, a, a, a strong economic relationship to build on, um, which is what we have in, um, between Australia, China, Australia, Japan, Japan, China, and, and the rest of the region. That's a positive sum. It's a, it's a nice place to, to get together and, and talk, such as the APEC summit. Um, and on the sidelines, at the margins, these leaders can meet and, and talk about these issues, if it's possible. And so I think it is important to have the bilateral um, top leadership visits, uh, meetings, um, for communication and, and furthering shared interests. So um, it is in the shared interest of these countries to have peace and prosperity and stability. Uh, and so I think that's a starting point um, um, for, for making progress on the security front. And on your second question, um, I think China is a very different case from Russia. China is much more <coughs> integrated into the regional and, and global economy and, and depends much more on its neighbours um, for its trade and investment um, and, and other links. Uh, but it's, it's not in China's interest to do anything like that, cause conflict, um, uh, as it'll most likely have the effect of destabilising their economy and, dest and, and therefore um, cause social instability. So. Uh, so maybe that's a little bit naive, but it's, it's deeply, deeply uh, integrated into a, a regional economy. We should end it here, but I do want to ask you one or one last question, uh, which you can answer in one minute. Uh, we've talked about uh, some of the important dimensions of the relationship uh, as, it, as they look at the moment and going forward a bit, but uh, in looking forward uh, at the potential of the relationship, what one or two things would each of you highlight uh, as important priorities in the development and deepening of the relationship between the two countries? Shira, why don't you start? <laughs> Beyond what I've said already? <laughs> um, well, it, it, there's a lot of potential because of all the things that we've talked about, the deep relationship the, and the, what Murray said, how close we are, how familiar we are. And so I think it's really um, spreading that kind of closeness with the two countries further in, in the region. I think there's potential to do that. Um, um, it may sound idealistic, but to, to do that cooperation. Mm. Can I have more than one minute? Uh, <laughs> because uh, I wanted to respond to that question also. Uh, <laughs> oh, I'm if sorry. I may. Please uh, do. Yeah. Mm. And, uh, I think uh, these days, I think. Uh, in, in international conferences, we see such scenes as Chinese scholars saying something like, you may not like us, but we are the reality. <laughs> or we may be now getting back to the traditional place in Asia. <laughs> and you know, those, those things are coming ex explicitly uh, from them. And I think uh, the uh, so-called new model of uh, major power relations has a lot to do with it. I think uh, this, this model has, two, again, two levels, I think. China is perfectly ready and wishes to coexist with the United States at the global level in dealing with global issues and even including trade and issues in the liberal international order. I think China is perfectly ready to live and to continue to develop under the premises of the so-called liberal international order at the global level. But uh, in Asia, uh, that's where we have doubt. And uh, one Southeast Asian diplomat said very eloquently, like, I don't think China wants to rule the world, but they simply wants to rule us. <laughs> uh, 
And I think there is no perhaps contradiction, <laughs> I, I mean, in the Chinese mind between economic interdependence and security friction. Because security friction is largely in the context of this seeking China centered Asia. But uh, th th there is no contradiction of that aspiration uh, with Chinese readiness to coexist with the US in other domains on one premise, which is US should accept that Asia Pacific is wide enough to accommodate interests of both countries. <laughs> and I don't think US is going to do that easily. Therefore, concerns about security. I think this is the picture. So from the Chinese world views, perhaps there is no contradiction. I mean, Asia with China at the center is a natural Asia. And I, I think China, Chinese really believe you know, there, there should be nothing wrong about it. You know, we are benign, and you shouldn't be so worried. And, uh, and, and, but, uh, the, the, so, so that causes some problem. And how to deal with that? So this is your answer to my question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's the biggest issue between Japan and Australia. We, sh we should have uh, the, the serious discussion about the nature of the rise of China. And uh, we should have the common assessment, you know, from the common viewpoints. And then we should have common strategy, which is not, of course, ganging up against China immediately, but it, it's a comprehensive strategy. And if Australia and Japan cannot engage in you know, serious dialogue about those quite serious, substantial issues which would decide the future of our life you know, at, at this time of the rise of China. And I think the ultimate hope, as far as I'm concerned, lies in Chinese liberal internationalists. I think Chinese liberal internationalists know very well future of China doesn't exist unless they continue to live under the premises of in liberal international order. And, uh, and I think Japan is, is in a very critical position because when Mr. Deng Xiaoping came to Japan, and he knew that Japan would be the first country which would help China modernize, reform, uh, through foreign direct investment as far as foreign official you know, assistance. So I, I, I don't say that Japan created today's China, <laughs> but Japan played a very important role mm -hmm. and, uh, in, in creating today's China. And also Japan was w one of the forerunners in the negotiations of Chinese entry into WTO. We are the first country among developed countries to conclude it bilateral you know, with China. And our intention was, of course, to bring China in you know, liberal international order. And uh, so Japanese foreign policy toward China has been like that for many years, you know, um, not to mention after diplomatic normalization in 72, until very recently. And the importance of Japan for China, I, I would assume, has not changed. But, you know, Matsushita Konosuke talked to Mr. Dan Xiaoping, and Dan Xiaoping asked Matsushita to invest in China, and he said immediately yes, and then they went to China. And the aftermath of that, we saw last year, you know, smashing the Panasonic factories. What happened? What went wrong? Mm -hmm. And uh, so Japan should think about it very seriously. And Chinese should think about this relationship very seriously, having those you know, positive records of history in mind. The last word to you, Amy. Can I just steal Soya Sensei's answer? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I think just to reiterate that, remembering these earlier periods, and even yeah. earlier, the 50s and 60s, being absolutely crucial as well. Uh, but I, I guess the one, the one indicator I would um, would say for the Australia-Japan relationship in particular is clearly discussing expectations about what this security co cooperation is for. Join me in thanking the panel for what's been the very well. <laughs> the College of Asia and Pacific to make some concluding remarks and then I'll thank a few people at the end. Thanks, Thanks. So reassuringly, I'm only here to close the proceedings. So I hope uh, that today's Japan update has left you uh, with a sense that you would like, to, would have liked it to continue longer, and and uh, would like more. It's deliberately designed as a one-day event uh, for people like you, the thinking community on Australia-Japan relations and on uh, regional policy issues. And what we're attempting to do is to interrogate and reframe what we think we know about Japan and its place in the world. So I'm delighted today, today that we've been able to do this from the standpoint of multiple disciplines. We've heard from history, political science, economics, linguistics, environment, international relations, and finally, to my great delight as a 
professor of law, we got to rule of law at the end. Um, we also heard a little bit about uh, strategic bankruptcy today, and I hope that we've convinced you that, at least for ANU, uh, Japan is a strategic priority, and also something that we regard as a very valuable asset. And our intention is to remain a very long-term stakeholder. So um, I want to uh, just close off by, uh, first of all, um, thanking you, the audience. Conversations need partners. And uh, it's a tribute to uh, the quality of um, the presentations today that you're here at the end and still engaging uh, very actively. We genuinely welcome your suggestions for things that you would like to see as uh, part of the thematic focus for, uh, for future updates. Our Vice-Chancellor, Ian Young, uh, formally opened the proceedings this morning uh, with praise for some of our senior Japan specialists here at ANU. And I want to join him uh, in uh, congratulating Professor Peter Drysdale on his recent honour from the Japan Foundation. Uh, but as a dean, um, I have to say I really also want to recognise and celebrate the rising stars uh, that we have here at ANU focusing on Japan and who make the field uh, across all of the disciplines so dynamic. So on your behalf, I'd like to thank the co-conveners of today's Japan Update, uh, Professor Simon Avenel, who's the director of our ANU Japan Institute, and uh, both uh, Dr. Shiro Armstrong and uh, Professor Ippei Fujiwara, who are our co-directors of the Australia Japan Research Centre, and of course, all of their staff. We particularly want to thank our major sponsor for today, the Australia Japan Foundation, under the chairmanship of Ambassador Murray McLean, and to acknowledge with thanks the support of the Embassy of Japan uh, here in Australia. Um, I've probably preempted much of what Shiro wanted to say, but let me uh, hand the podium to him to thank the hardest working people today who are our speakers. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Veronica, and, and you did thank most of the people I wanted to thank, but that's okay because I'd like to thank them too. And um, th thank you for everyone for sticking with us all day. Um, it's nice to see so many familiar faces in the audience, um, and it did make the, the sessions lively. Um, the speakers uh, who came from afar, um, from Japan and the United States, uh, to share and make accessible some of their deeper research, which um, is really important to us. And, and what we try to do here at the ANU and especially the Crawford School um, is to not just do our research, but to try and make it accessible to, to everyone. Um, again, thank you to the Japan Foundation, Australia Japan Foundation uh, and the Japanese Embassy for all the support. Um, and importantly, my team, um, Rosie Tran, Akira Kinefuchi and Kaise Iwano, who's up there, yep, um, and the extended team uh, and Jill Mulbray for her help earlier on in the update before she got a promotion and left us, um, and, and the East Asia Forum team more broadly. Um, and just before we all leave, as Veronica said, we are very keen for feedback on today's proceedings, both the substance, the organisation of it, the logistics. Um, we do intend to run it next year and um, in the future, so any feedback you can give us um, is most welcome. Um, and most helpful, uh, and there are some hard copy surveys out the front. Um, but for now, um, I'd like to thank everyone for staying um, and hope to see you next year at Japan Update 2015. Thank you.